And your timing? Speed. Speed of which you drive? Builds, whether you're going up or down. I always say you have a tire pressure. Weight of the cargo in your car. Okay, there's already seven variables there, and there's a few others. The air conditioner being on or off, the windows being opened or closed, the weather outside, a hot day or a cold day. So, pretty, pretty um, large size of list. I'm going to narrow it down to five variables that I'd like to investigate. So, A to C, D, E. And I'm going to allocate A to be the air conditioner. I'm going to call it the conditioner rather than AC because we've got A, C, B, C is involved here. So let's just call that conditioner. B is the speed which I'm driving at, so slow speed or fast speed. C is cargo, whether I'm carrying passengers perhaps or for, for some sort of cargo. D is my tire pressure, low versus high, and E is the weather outside. So perhaps I'm interested to see if weather really has an effect on gas mileage. Now there's obviously many other variables, but let's just, I'm going down to five factors in this case, just to make this a manageable example. So the first step is to figure out what your variables are. Let me say I've only got eight experiments. I'm going to run these experiments over eight days for a period of time where I can only afford to run eight, eight runs. So that brings me down to the second row in that table, I've got five factors. So I'm going to run a fractional factorial 2 to the 5 minus 2. So let's uh, write out the 2 to the 5 minus 2 fractional factorial table in terms of A, B, C. I'm running eight experiments. I allocate A, B, and C in the usual full factorial manner. So Minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus. And column C is four minuses followed by four pluses. My generator here says to generate E as the product of AB. So D, my higher pressure variable, is the product of AB is plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus. And E is generated as AC. So AC gets me plus, plus times minus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, 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 Plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So there, that immediately tells me how I run my eight experiments. Straightforward. Okay, so I would go run my experiments in random order. I'd measure a column Y and record it here as I do each experiment. That is my log sheet or my run sheet. As I'm doing my experiments, I record all my information there, my Ys. I would add extra columns, extra variables as well um, that I might observe during my experiments. So if the traffic was heavy or slow and so forth. They might be interesting after the fact. So if we go look back here at this example, this example says step one, allocate your, your base factors. Step two is to go find your generators and generate your data tape. I've done that now. Step three here says determine your alias set. To do that, you require your defining relationship. So the general rule for a 2 to the k minus p factorial is, in this case, p, k is 5, p is 2. I'm going to have two generators. There they are, d equals ab and e equals ac. There are my two generators. The defining relationship has two to the p words, so I expect four words. The first word in your defining relationship is always I. So let's do that over here. My first defining, rela the defining relationship is I equals. So there's my first word in my defining relationship. I need three more. I have two to the p words. 
Your defining relationship is the combination of all the generators. So you take your generators one at a time, and then you take your generators two at a time. If I have more generators, I take my generators three at a time, and so forth. And I have to express my defining relationship as I equals. So if I write my first generator is D equals AB, I need to express that as I equals something. Well, the only way I can get it in that form is multiply both sides by D. D times D is I on the left hand side. ABD is there on the right hand side. So there's my, my first word in my generator. My second generator is E is AC. So again, multiply both sides of that generator by E to get an I. So the next word is AC. My final word is found by the combination of all four generators, the product of all, all four, uh, sorry, the product of all the generators. So it's, take a look at ABD multiplied by ACE. So I'm taking the combination of those two generators. So A, A, B, C, B, A, A is I, B, C, B, B, or just B, C. So that's my defining relationship. textbook and you'll have to do one as well for the uh, final assignment. So we've got our defining relationship. The next step is to determine the confounding pattern using that defining relationship. This is how it, how it works. Take your defining relationship and we want to find now which factors are going to be confounded with which interactions. So if I'd like to determine, in this gas mileage example, my factor A for the air conditioner, I'm not going to be able to estimate that on its own. A is going to be confounded with some other values, with other factors. What is it going to be confounded with? Well, let's take a look. My slope coefficient for A is going to be confounded with, take A and multiply it by every term in that defining relationship. So I'm going to work down here and then I'll, I'll write my final answer up here. So A multiplied by every term in the defining relationship is A times I is equal to AA 
D is equal to A, A, C, B is equal to A, B, C, B. <coughs> Let me simplify that. A times I is just A is equal to the product of A and A gives me B, D. The product of A and A simplifies so that's equal to C, E. There is no simplification in the final one. So A, B, C, B. So A is going to be confounded with BD, and it's going to be confounded with CE, as well as this five-factor interaction. When we write down our estimates here, we usually just drop out the three-factor, four-factor, and higher-order interactions. We only concern ourselves with the two-factor interactions, because for the most part, three-factor interactions are almost never significant. So my effect of A, my air conditioner effect, is not going to be able to get the estimated on its own. It's going to be mixed up with the VD interaction, in other words, the speed pressure interaction, as well as the CE, cargo weather interaction. So we write there that A is equal to A plus VD plus CE, as well as the higher order terms which I drop off. <coughs> Calculate for yourselves what uh, the speed main effect, so the V main effect, what is it going to be confounded with? So write that down for yourselves. As well as C, D, and E. slowly, so B, we write down B, and we multiply it by every term in my defining relationship. I have four terms, so I have four, four words after that. B, I is equal to A, B, D, B is equal to A, C, B, B is equal to B, B, C, D, B. The only simplification that occurs here is this BB disappears and goes to 1. All the others don't simplify. Oh, there's a BBC. But we only write down our main effect and two factor interactions. So in this case, B is confounded with AD. All the other terms written over there are two or three factor higher interactions. So I don't be sure of this. C is confounded with. You want to find that one? Uh, C plus AB. C plus AB. And we get that, let's just work through that one as well. C multiplied by every term in my defining relationship. The first one there is A, B, C, D. The next one is A, C, C, E. The fourth and final one is B, C, C, E. So the only simplification that occurs are those two C's that go to unity. That's a four-factor interaction, that's a three-factor interaction, and there's a two-factor interaction of A. Okay, is everyone clear on, clear on this process now? So the final ones, uh, D, will be confounded with AC, uh, AB, and E will be confounded with AC. Because we want to see 
what two factor interactions are going to be confounded with our main effects? Are there any two factor interactions in the gas mileage example that might be of interest to us? Okay. If there are two factor interactions that might show up, we certainly want to know about them ahead of time. There's certain two factor interactions that are not going to, to show up. For example, your air conditioner and speed up are not going to interact together to affect the gas mileage. Your air, your air conditioner and the speed at which you run your car at are not interacting with your air, are certainly not going to affect gas mileage jointly. They affect gas mileage individually, but together they're not going to affect gas mileage. Their air conditioner and the cargo also not likely to interact. Air conditioner and its iron pressure not likely to interact. But your air conditioner will interact with the weather on a hot day versus a cold day. So if I run my AC on a cold day, it's certainly going to work less hard than on the AC running on a hot day. The AC will affect the gas mileage separately. The weather might affect the gas mileage separately. But jointly, we certainly do expect the air conditioner and the weather to have an interaction. Okay. So let's make a note of that. This is one two-factor interaction that might be important. multiplied by weather. Don't use letters here. we will see why in a minute. We're going to start shuffling our letters around and then they won't match up. So the air conditioner multiplied by the weather certainly will be a two-factor interaction that we expect ahead of time to exist. So if we anticipate that existence, we want to be sure how we're going to structure our experiments to handle it. You can go through all these others. There's, there are some two-factor interactions that are likely to occur. But the speed and cargo may interact with each other. But another one that certainly will interact is the cargo weight, so low weight in your car or high weight in your car with the tire pressure. So the weight in your car will affect gas mileage, the pressure of your tires will affect gas mileage. But if you put a lot of people in your car with low tire pressure, you're certainly going to see a greater impact on the So another two-factor interaction is the cargo pressure interaction. Okay, let's just consider those two as being the only two-factor interactions that might impact our process. You may find a third one as well, but um, I just want to deal with these two. So this is how you, you um, might look at this. Let's take a look at this now. So for my current assignment, let me do this, A, B, C, D, E. In my current assignment of this, I've got A as conditioner, B as speed, C as cargo, E as pressure, and E as weather. So I'm going to call this round one because this is my first allocation of the variables. Just I arbitrarily allocated my variables to those letters. Now I'm going to look at what the impact of that is. The two-factor interaction that I'm interested in of conditional multiplied by weather, that is the AE interaction. And the cargo pressure interaction, that's the CD interaction. What is AD confounded with? <coughs> C, and C is cargo. So this is telling me right away, if I keep this allocation of variables, I will not be able to tell the cargo effect apart from the AE, or the conditioner weather interaction. So I expect the conditioner and the weather to interact. I also expect the amount of cargo that I have in my car to interact, uh, to, to be an important variable affecting gas mileage. But this is telling me right away that if I keep this allocation as specified here, I will not be able to tell those apart from each other. They're going to be confounded with each other. 
Let's take a look at the cargo pressure interaction, CD, which I expect to be important. What's that going to be confounded? Ones, those are, there's 10 two-factor interactions that will appear in a full experiment. Let's take a look at the ones we have used up, or accounted for at least. We've accounted for BD up here, so BD is used up. In my, it's confounded with A. CE is used up. It's confounded with A. AD is confounded with B. AE is confounded with C, AB is confounded with D, AC is confounded with E. How many are remaining? Four. Four. There's four remaining. So, let's take a look. We pick any one of them, it doesn't matter which one, and we can say, let's take BC for example. I can estimate actually a BC two more slope coefficients I can add to my model. There, I can pick any two from this table. E, C, B, E, C, B, or B, E. Let me just pick E, C, then I can add them to my, my table here as plus, minus, times, minus, to plus, minus, times, minus, to plus, plus, minus, 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 plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus. So plus, plus, minus, 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 plus, plus is my BC two-factor interaction. So now I've accounted for BC. What is BC going to be confounded with? Let's add that to my list over here. BC BC is confounded with which variables? Well, we multiply it in the, it's no different to before. BC is now just a factor, the product of B and C. I multiply it by every entry in my defined relationship. So BCI is equal to BC ABD is equal to BC 
ACE is equal to BC, BC, D. Okay, so BC, if we simplify this a bit, this first term over here, there's a B and a B that cancel out, but that's a three factor interaction, so we can ignore it. B, C, A, C, E, the only simplification we get is a C multiplied by a C. That's still a three factor interaction, so we can ignore it. The final term is B, C, B, C. Those two cancel out, and there's a D, E. So B, C, this tells me, is going to be confounded with the D, E two factor interaction. I cannot estimate the BC two-factor interaction separately from the DE two-factor interaction. So that we've accounted for BC then, we also now have accounted for DE. But one more slope coefficient that I can estimate, and that is, let's arbitrarily pick it to be the BE two-factor interaction. So we'll repeat this process once more for those uh, that might have seen it so clearly the first time. So BE, then I can go fill in my table, here's the product of B times E, so minus times plus is minus, minus times minus is plus, plus times plus, plus times minus, minus times minus, minus times plus, plus times minus, and then plus plus. So minus plus plus minus minus plus minus minus plus. What is BE confounded with? already BE should be confounded with CD, but let's just confirm that. So this two-factor interaction BE multiplied by every term in my defining relationship. There's four terms, so BE times I is equal to ABD times BE is equal to ACD times BD is equal to B, C, D, B times E. So just take B, C, and multiply it by every term in that defining relationship, and then simplify it out. So my B, B's cancel here, but that's a three factor interaction. A, C, B, B, E. Okay, not too much of a simplification. This final term I get B, B cancelling out, I get B, B cancelling out, and that left B is C. So B, B is going to be found in the C. And those are, in fact, the last two interactions. So I'm not able to estimate my B, B separately from B, B, C. So your confounding pattern, the, the key result that you're seeing from this example is your confounding pattern should have as many rows as you have experiments. I have eight experiments, minus one for the intercept, leaves me with seven available coefficients that I can estimate, so I should have seven entries in my confounding pattern and only report your confounding pattern up to the two-factor interaction, and not the one factor. Okay, so now, we're, now we can come back to figuring out our allocation of variables. I had said here earlier we were looking at the CD two-factor interaction, the cargo pressure interaction, and we were wondering, are we going to be able to estimate the cargo pressure interaction Clearly, and what is it going to be able to do? What is it going to be confounded with? So the CD interaction now, I can go look back here at my confounding pattern, and we can determine it's going to be alias with the BE. So that last row we've just derived, CD is confounded with BE. 
So <coughs> do we expect VE to be a significant interaction? So speed multiplied by weather. With the, we the weather has an impact on your car, the speed has an impact on your car, but would speed and weather jointly have an impact on your car? Gas mileage. <laughs> okay, so this is how you can see why Tiffany and I had these long discussions. Right? Because every time we get to this point, we're like, well, do we think this? Do we think this might happen? Do we anticipate a two-factor interaction? And if we do anticipate it, would it even be interesting or useful for us? Okay. So, so we're now at this point. We've already got a problem. My, my main problem here is AE, the air conditioner weather interaction, which I find interesting and want to estimate, is going to be confounded with C, the cargo effect. And cargo is also an, an effect that I find interesting and important. So I'm not going to be able to estimate cargo separately from the air conditioner weather interaction. So what do I do? the variables about. If you're not happy with the confounding you're seeing, the only thing you can do right now is to switch your variable allocation. And you keep trying new variable allocations until you find one that makes you comfortable. If you cannot find a confounding pattern that makes you comfortable, it's pointing out that you need to go to a higher level or a higher number of experiments. And you've got too much confounding that you can't deal with. So you need to go add more experiments. So one thing that people often do is they simply just use trial and error. They reallocate their variables. So they just shuffle this list around, check their confounding pattern until they get a combination down here that they're happy with. Okay, that can take some time and it's inefficient. So there's a, there's a better way to do it. The better way to do it is to say, well, I'm interested in the weather and air conditioner effect. So what most people do is they'll have several rounds. I'll just jump to the final round and show you how you should do this rather than how you do the trial and error. If you're interested in the weather and air conditioner effect, just call them the, the first two. It doesn't matter. Conditioner and weather. <coughs> okay, so now you've got A, B. That's a two-factor interaction you are interested in. What is AB going to be confounded with? D. That's actually our generator, so we expected that. So D is going to be confounded with AB. Outside of air conditioning and weather, I've got three remaining variables. Speed, cargo, and pressure. Which of those three am I most willing to sacrifice? In other words, which of those three am I going to be comfortable with if I'm not able to estimate it clearly? factorials are about. You're not able to estimate, you can't get all your information unless you do the full set of experiments. If you go to a reduced number of experiments, you must make some sacrifices. So you, you pick one. We've already determined that we want to estimate cargo cleanly or, uh, or, or with, with less confounding. So I'm down to speed or pressure. I'm just going to pick speed. Where do I allocate speed? I allocate speed to D. A, B plus D is going to be confounded. Then I'm left with cargo and pressure. So if I allocate those to C and E, 
cargo and pressure. So that's CE. CE is confounded with BD and is confounded with A. Okay, so CE then is going to be confounded with the air conditioner effect and it's going to be confounded with the BD, the weather speed. So weather and speed may or may not have an interaction. If I still don't like this allocation, I can then just shuffle these last three around. But I've, I've fixed those two now, and I can shuffle those last three around. So this is the sort of thought process that goes into fractional factorials. Right? It's, it's not, there's no fixed rule for how A, B, C, and D, and E are allocated. And there's a lot of a lot of anticipation and a lot of planning ahead of time. Would it make more sense to if you know that one of your replacements is going to have a few burgers to choose choose your effective values to be not included in those? Because if one equation is like three factors, and so that's occasionally further than the other. Obviously, that's going to hide some of the variables, so why would you be tied to the allocations where they weren't? Right. No, it's exactly, and then that's why I say, like, Tiffany and I spent, and when I had design experience, I spent quite a bit of time shuffling around my letter allocations until I get one that's the least bad for me. We'll recognize that fractional factorial, there's a cost <coughs> of You just shuffle your letters around until you find the cost that's the most acceptable. The price, we recognize we're going to pay a price for shuffling our data around, our numbers around, but we choose the least bad. Now, here's some guidance for us. Let's come back to, let's come back to our slides and um, help us with this bit. Because it gets a little bit tedious um, looking at some of these allocations. So there's some rules of thumb that tell us ahead of time what's going to be found to the us. So we know our generators. Our generators tell us how to create the fractional factorial. Our defining relationship, this guy up here, this long set of words that are equated to each other, that tells me how my variables are confounded with each other. Well, there's some, some simple rules here that we can use. We're going to introduce this concept of the resolution. We've seen it already. The resolution is the shortest word in your defining relationship. So if you go look at your 2 to the 7 minus 4 factorial example that's here in the slides, it's called a resolution 3 design. The shortest word there is 3 letters, three letters long. If you go through that lengthy derivation for the, for the defining relationship, you will find that all your main effects are confounded with two factor interactions. So main effects are confounded with two factor interactions on the resolution 3 design. If you look at a resolution 4 design and you write out the defining relationship and you write out the confounding pattern, what you'll find is quite interesting. Your main effects are only confounded with three factor interactions of high value. Main effects are not confounded with any two factor interactions. So if you want an experiment where there's many two factor interactions you're interested in, you should not be running a resolution 3 design. Resolution 3 designs will always have main effects confounded with two factor interactions. Resolution 4 designs will only have main effects confounded with three factor interactions. So that's a great result because it means that I can simply go allocate my, date, my variable letters and be less concerned that I'm going to have confounding as And then you can get a resolution 5 design. A resolution 5 design, you'll your main effects are only confounded with four-factor interactions. So you can start to see why they're called that resolution. So let's take a look at, at that. Let me allocate my main effects to be one. My two-factor interactions, I'll call those a two. My three-factor interactions, I'll call a three. So a resolution five design, say, simply say five minus one. So five minus one is four. My main effects, level one, are confounded with four factor interactions. <coughs> five minus two gets you three, so two factor interactions will be confounded with three factor interactions in the resolution of five design. So we can estimate two factor interactions, but they will be confounded with three factor interactions. 
5 minus 3 gets you 2. 3 factor interactions will be confounded with 2 factor interactions. So just get this symmetric. 5 minus 4 is 1. So again, main effects will be confounded with 4 factor interactions. Resolution uh, 4 design is done in the same way. 2 minus 2, uh, 4 minus 2 gets you 2. So 2 factor interactions are confounded with 2 factor interactions. We saw that for resolution 4 design. Main effects confounded with three factor interactions, but also you know that two factor interactions will be confounded with two factor interactions. So that, that's what those Roman numerals mean in the table, and that's they're super helpful to help you allocate experiments without writing out that long confounding pattern and figuring out what your confounding actually is. How do you use this result? You use this result as follows. You start your experiments always, if possible, using resolution three designs. On a new process where you have no idea of how the system interacts and behaves, you simply want to screen the process to get an understanding of what is important and what is not important. A resolution three design is a great starting point because your main effects will be confounded with two factor interactions. But your intention for a resolution redesign is simply to find out, at the very least, what these guys are. A, B, C, D, E. If you find afterwards that they're important, you can go do an additional experiment to, to make sure that that main effect is not confounded with the two-factor interaction. I'll talk a bit about that next time. How we can go de-alias an experiment. Okay, so we can go do a second round of experiments where we de-alias, but your purpose with the screening design is simply to find out what, what does affect why and what doesn't. Your resolution four designs are for a deeper understanding of the system. Resolution four designs, your main effects are only compounded with three factor interactions, which are likely to be small. So they're good for getting a more in-depth understanding. And then the final sets of designs this is when you're really trying to fine-tune the process down to small, small percentages. And so you want a really good model of the process. You do a resolution 5 design and a full factorial design as well. You get many, many coefficients in the least squares model. You get a high level of accuracy in your predictions. But they come at tremendous cost. So every time you go from here down, this level, you're doing more and more experiments for the same number of factors. The final uh, point I want to make in today's class um, is I would, I would encourage you to go through these slides here on the saturated design example. I will come back to them. But I do want to just end off with this uh, final slide. It's a little bit further down, back to this cube and introduce the final new concept called projectivity. Projectivity is defined as the resolution minus one. So whatever your resolution is for a given experiment, subtract one with that. And what that is, is the highest number of factors that form a full factorial inside that fraction. So your fractional factorial has embedded inside it always a full factorial. You know, you've seen this diagram in this class to illustrate that. But ahead of time, we're not sure what the size of that full factorial is. The projectivity tells you that. So in this example, the projectivity is 2. Embedded inside that resolution 3 design, Resolution is 3, projectivity is 2. There's a full factorial in two factors. The highest number of factors that form a full factorial. What is the projectivity for a 2 to the 6 minus 2 factorial? Take a look at the table in front of you. Resolution, what's the resolution of a 2 to the 6 minus 2? In the table in front of it's a resolution 4 design. So the projectivity would be 3. It's telling me that 
there's a full factorial in three factors embedded inside that fraction factorial. So I, I'm investigating six factors, three factors of those six create a full factorial. In other words, if I go and eliminate three variables as unimportant afterwards, so I go from six to five to four to three, those remaining three variables, no matter which three they are, will form a full factorial. So I just wanted you to have this idea in your head because next class I'm going to talk about eliminating variables. And why is this interesting to eliminate variables? Well, the more variables we eliminate, we start to approach back to the full factorial. Thank you.